Elroth Condemned, Chapter 30 of Shardik by Richard Adams With a flow of relief, like that felt by a child when light is brought into the dark room where he is lying afraid, Keldrek realized that he had been dreaming. The child desists from frightening himself with the fancy that the oak chest might be a crouching animal, and accepts that the grotesque face peering down upon him is nothing but a pattern of lines in the rafters. And at once, other, true proportions, not actually revealed by, but nevertheless consequent upon the bringing of the light, are plain. The distant sound outside the window, though unaltered from a few moments before, is now clearly not faint evil laughter, but the croaking of frogs, while, by a subtle shift of emphasis, the smell of new-sawn wood, of penned cattle, or of drying skins, which just now seemed so menacing, the very smell of fear, alters in its effect as it becomes linked with familiar people and bright diurnal things. But with those things return almost at once the shadows which they cast. Will he be scolded because he cried out in his fear? Or has someone perhaps discovered that yesterday he did what he should not? He has only exchanged one kind of anxiety for another. In Keldorek's wakening mind, the misty topography of thought seemed to turn as though upon a pivot. Dream and reality took up their proper places, and he recognized the true aspect and features of his situation. He had not, he realized, been summoned to the presence of Belka Trisette. That was a dream, and therefore, thank God, he need no longer try to devise how best to defend himself. The aching pain in his body was certainly real, but was due not to blows received by the High Baron's men, but to his fight with the intruder in the hall. He was not, after all, in danger of death, yet instead there now returned to him the recollection of all that he had forgotten in sleep. The wounding of Shardik, the burning hall, Zilthi lying on the stones, and his own injuries. How long had he been asleep? Suddenly, as a wall crumbles at the point where it is most vulnerable, the drowsy, undiscriminating progress of his awakening was broken by the realization that he did not know what had become of Shardik. At once he cried out, Shardik! opened his eyes, and tried to start up. It was daylight, and he was lying in his own bed. Through the southern window, with its view over the barb, a pale sun was shining. It seemed an hour or two after dawn. His left hand was bound up, his shoulder, too, he could feel, and the opposite thigh. Biting his lip with pain, he sat up and put his feet to the floor. As he did so, Sheldra came into the room. My lord, Shardik, what has become of Lord Shardik? My lord, General Zelda has come to speak with you. He is in haste. He says it is important. She hurried out, while he shouted feebly after her, Shardik! Shardik! She returned with Zelda who was cloaked and booted as though for a journey. Shardik, he cried, and tried to stand, but stumbled back on the bed. Is he alive? W will he live? Like master, like man, replied Zelda with a smile. Shardik is alive, but it's a deep wound, and he needs rest and care. How long have I been asleep? This is the second day since you were hurt. We gave you a drug, my lord, said Sheldra. The knife blade broke off short in your thigh, but that we were able to take out. Zilthi! What of Zilthi? She is alive, but her brain is damaged. She tries to speak, but can find no words. It will be long, or never, before she can serve Lord Shardik again. Keldrek put his head in his hands, thinking with anguish of the quicksilver lass who had once mistaken him for the quarry and shot an arrow between his arm and body. She who, standing alone in the waning moonlight, had seen Lord Shardik strike down the treacherous messenger on the road to Gelt. "'Keldrek,' said Zelda, interrupting his thoughts, "'no doubt you need to rest, but nevertheless you must listen to me, for time is very short and I have to be gone. There are things to be done, but the ordering of them I must leave in your care. That should do well enough, for the whole city desires only to serve and obey you. They know that it was you alone who saved Lord Shardik's life from those villains.' Keldorek raised his head and looked at him in silence. "'Yesterday, at dawn,' went on Zelda, "'a messenger reached Bekla from the army in Lepan. 
His news was that Santilcare Kitlis, after sending a force to distract our attention with a pretended attack west of Ikat, had himself passed us on the east flank and was marching north through Tanilda. What does he intend? That we do not know. He may not have any preconceived aim, apart from seeking support in the eastern provinces, but he will probably form an aim in the light of whatever support he gets. We've got to follow and try to contain him, that's certain. A general like Urketlis wouldn't begin a march unless he felt sure he could make something of it. Gedladan left yesterday morning. I've stayed to see the raising of three or more companies and some extra supplies. The city governor will tell you the details. I'm off now, with every man I've been able to impress. They're waiting for me in the caravan market, and a cheap lot they are, I'm afraid. Where are you making for? Thet it to Nilda. Our army's coming north after Urketlis, so somewhere between here and Thet it, I'm bound to strike their line of march. The trouble is that Urketlis achieved so much surprise, he must be nearly two days ahead of them. I wish I could come with you. I wish it too. Would to God Lord Shardik could join us for a new battle. I can see it all. Darkness falling and Urketlis struck down with one blow of his paw. Heal him, Keldrek. Restore him for all our sakes. I'll see you get news. Every day, if possible. But one thing more I must learn at once. What happened two nights ago? It was Mallow of Cabin, wasn't it, who wounded Lord Shardik? But who fired the roof of the hall, and why? I'll tell you, answered Zelda. And fools we were not to foresee it. It was Elroth, Ban of Sarkid, he who passed us when we were walking that day above the barb. If you'd not acted as you did in leaping from the pool, Lord Shardik would have died at the hands of that precious pair. The roof would have fallen in on him and on Zilthi, and both the traitors would have escaped. But Elroth, is he dead too? No, he was taken alive as he came down from the roof. It will be your task to see him executed. To see him executed? I? Who else? You are king and the priest of Shardik. I have little relish for it, even when I think what he tried to do. To kill in battle is one thing, an execution is another. Come, Keldrick, play with the children. We can't afford to have you turn squeamish. The man's murdered an Ortogan sentry and attempted a sacrilegious crime, wicked beyond belief. Obviously, he must be executed before you and in the presence of every baron and provincial delegate in Bekla. Indeed, you will have to require the attendance of all Ortelgans of any rank or standing whatever. There are so few left in the city, and the Ortelgans ought to outnumber the provincial delegates by at least three to one. Keldorek was silent, looking down and picking at the blanket. At length, ashamed of his weakness, he asked hesitantly, Must... must he be tortured? Burned? Zelda turned towards the window overlooking the barb and stood gazing out across the water. After a little, he said, This is not a question either of indulging mercy or of gratifying revenge, but simply of achieving an effect for political reasons. People have got to see the man die and to be convinced by what is done that we are right and he is wrong. Now, if a man, a bandit, say, is to be executed to impress the poor and ignorant and deter them from law-breaking, it is best if he dies a cruel death, for such people have no imagination, and lead hard, rough lives themselves. A quick death seems little hardship to them. It is necessary that the man should be humiliated and deprived of his dignity before their mean minds can take in the lesson. But with men of the better sort, it's another matter. If we torture a man like Elleroth of Sarkid, his courage is likely to excite admiration and pity, and many of the delegates, who are men of rank, may even end by feeling contempt for us. We would do better to aim at rousing respect for our mercy. Although it is only just that he should die, it is with regret that we kill such a man. That is what we must give out. It is your affair, Keldrick, but since you ask me, I would advise you to have him beheaded with a sword. It will be enough, with a man of Elleroth's standing, that we put him to death at all. Very well. He shall be executed in the hall, in the presence of Lord Shardick. I should have told you, the fire did much harm before we could quench it. Baltus says the roof is in a bad state and will take some time to repair. Is he the best judge? Has no one else been up to see it? I cannot tell, Keldrick. You forget the news that I told you of the war. All is at sixes and sevens, and you must see to this yourself. Lord Shardick is your mystery, and one which you have shown that you understand. Of the roof, I can tell you only what the man told me. Order the matter as you think best, so long as Elroth is executed before all the delegates. And now, goodbye. Only keep the city, as well as you have kept Lord Chardick, and all may yet be well. Pray for the defeat of your Ketlis, and wait for news. He was gone, and Keldorek, full of pain and tired to exhaustion, 
could remain awake hardly long enough for his wounds to be dressed before lying down to sleep again. The next day, however, already troubled by the delay in commencing his task, and anxious to have it done and finished, he sent for the city governor and the garrison commander, and set about the arrangements. He was determined that the execution should take place in the hall and in the presence of Shardick, since he felt it to be just and right that Elleroth should die upon the scene of his crime. Also, he thought, there, more than anywhere else, he himself would be seen as the agent of Shardick, invested with the implacable and divine authority proper to one putting to death an aristocrat and the hereditary lord of a province twice as large as Ortelga. The roof of the hall, he was informed, though in a precarious state, and unable to be repaired until some heavy lengths of timber could be brought in to replace the two central tie-beams, was nevertheless safe enough for an assembly. "'The way we see it, my lord,' said Baltus, half-turning for corroboration to the Beckland master-builder standing at his elbow, "'it's sound enough, unless there was to be any real violence, rioting or fighting or anything the like of it. The roof's supported by the walls, you see, but the tie-beams—' That's to say, the cross beams, they've been that much burned that there's some might not stand up to a heavy shaking. Would shouting perhaps be dangerous? asked Kelderek. Or a man struggling, perhaps? Oh, no, my lord, it need not. It'd need a lot more than that to make it go, like the old woman's ox. Even if the beams was to, to be repaired, they'd still stand up for months, very like, although the rain'd be going in through the holes, of course. Very well, replied Kelderek. You have leave to go. Then... Turning to the governor, he said, The execution will take place tomorrow morning in the hall of the king's house. You will see to it that not less than a hundred and fifty Ortelgan and Beckland lords and citizens are present, more if possible. No one is to carry arms, and the provincial delegates are to be separated and dispersed about the hall, no more than two delegates to be seated together. The rest I leave in your hands. The lady Sheldra, however, will be caring for Lord Shardick, and you are to meet her early tomorrow and take account of her wishes. When all is ready to your satisfaction, she will come here to summon me.